I always thought that we wasted time because we were lazy or we were indecisive. And while some of these things may be true for you, there actually is a deeper reason why we feel that way. One of my favorite books is called Flow. I was recently rereading it on the Blinkist app. Flow talks about flow state, which is experienced by musicians, rappers, singers, athletes when they're in the zone. When they're performing at such a high level, they even forget space, time, and everything around them, and you get to see art or magic in real life. Now, there are a lot of amazing lessons inside Flow, but one of my favorite ones is this discussion when you're looking at skills versus challenges. How many of you have ever felt that you don't have the best skills in an area and the challenge feels really high? Chances are, if you've experienced that, you end up feeling frustrated or stuck and disappointed in yourself. And that's one of the reasons why you start overthinking and procrastinating. You don't have the skills, you have a challenge or a goal that's set really high, and now you feel overwhelmed and overburdened by the height of that target that you just give up and stop working. Sometimes we have the opposite experience, where our skill is really high, but actually we haven't looked at our challenges. We've been doing the same thing over and over again. We've been repeating the easy win. And in that situation, we sometimes feel bored, lost or confused. We feel like our life doesn't have meaning, it doesn't have purpose, and there's nothing exciting or thrilling about the work that we do. The author goes on to say that flow is achieved when our skill meets our challenge. So when we really want to experience that flow state, being in the zone, feeling that momentum, feeling that energy, thriving, we have to make sure that our skill and challenges match. Are we feeling frustrated and stuck because our skills are too low and our challenges are too high? Or are we feeling bored because our skills are too high and our challenges are low? In either case, we want to focus on either increasing our skills or increasing our challenge. That helps us focus on the area that we actually need to have an impact and we stop wasting time with all the distractions. So now, instead of procrastinating and overthinking, we start focusing on a list of things that can help us improve our skills. You have books, coaching, mentors, communities, courses. All of these are phenomenal ways to start learning. Now, if you're someone who needs to increase your challenge, your challenge can be increased through networking. I remember when I used to speak or get invited to speak at colleges and schools. I love that experience. I still do it today whenever I can. But at one point I realized I wanted to stretch my comfort zone. Then I started working with corporate companies because I really wanted to help organizations build new models of thinking. Today, I work with so many Fortune 500 companies and enjoy the experience deeply, but I also wanted to extend my challenge beyond that. I started speaking on stages. I started speaking at my own events. What I found is that you can extend your challenge by increasing your goals or targets or by changing the scale or the depth. Sometimes we challenge ourselves by trying to affect more people, do more things, and sometimes we challenge ourselves by going deeper in the areas we're already in. And finally, a new way of challenging yourself is a new industry. When you think about someone like Michael Jordan, who went off to play baseball, or you think about Steve Jobs, who went into movies and Pixar and animation, people have challenged themselves across industries when they've truly mastered their field. So the question I want you to answer is this. Instead of procrastinating and overthinking, do you need to work on your skills or do you need to work on your challenges? And you'll know where to start. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. All my life. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Jay Shetty, and my take on his top 10 rules for success. Enjoy. Rule number two, keep expanding the goalpost. One of my favorite ways to deal with success is continue trying to be the least successful person 
in mm. the room that you and I think there's those statements of like you know never Always be the, the dumbest person yeah never be the smartest person in the room etc and I think it's the same with if you become successful don't just stand at the top of the mountain don't just stand at the top of the building go back down the stairs and and keep building and keep living as that person that got you there because you only got there because you started from the bottom Right, no one starts at the top, mm. and so you started at the bottom and you built it up, and it was that mindset that you started with that got you there. And so you wanna keep rediscovering that mindset and new parts of it, there are new parts of that mindset too, where you're always trying to challenge yourself. Mm. And so for me, one of the best ways of dealing with success is keep expanding the goalposts, right? Keep widening the goalposts, keep making them harder to reach and challenging yourself, because when you challenge yourself, and you push yourself out of your comfort zone, you're naturally humbled. Mm -hmm. Because you're naturally humbled when you're walking into spaces. I'm sure you feel this sometimes. Like sometimes I walk into a room and I'm like, how did I even get here? Yeah. Right? Like sitting I'm, at a table, I'm like, I'm the why should I be here? Yeah, yeah, like and and there's part of it that's imposter syndrome, and that can have its own negativity, but part of that just lets me feel like a beginner again. Yeah. And I appreciate that feeling and I go, this is amazing because learning to be grateful and stop just thinking that, oh, I earned all of this and I did it all myself and I'm self-made. You start recognizing gratitude for all the people that yeah. got you there. So for me in success, first thing is be grateful for all your teachers, mentors, guides, people that got you there. The second thing is always keep challenging yourself because the more you're out of your comfort zone, the more naturally you stay humble. You don't stay humble by trying to be humble. You become humbled constantly right. by trying to do stuff that's out of your league, which constantly makes you prepare, work, deepen Study, what you Study, all that stuff. All of that stuff that makes you go there again. And, and then the third thing you do with success is I think you try and share it with others. Mm. You try and use your platforms as an opportunity to give other people a platform yeah. so that they can come up as well because you're reminded of what a beautiful gift you have. Rule number three, have intention for the future. In the book, I talk about how it's about training your mind for peace and purpose every day. And that's the peace part. That's how you find peace in difficult times. You recognize it's part of the process. But I always like to offer the service element too, which is the future part, the purpose part. It's, I would think about the year 2030 or 2050, whichever year you, you want to meditate on, 10 years time, 30 years time. And think about your kids or your grandkids or young people around you or nieces and nephews, if you don't have kids, people around you, they'll be going to school and they'll be learning about 2020 in their history books. And let's say that one of their teacher's assignments is you have to go back to your parents or grandparents and ask them, what were they doing in 2020? So imagine now you're sitting at a dining table in 2030 or 2050, your kids or your grandkids come up to you, mom, dad, dad, mom, dad, dad, mom, mom, what, um, no dad, no mom, I don't know what the language is gonna be then. Uh, and you just say to your parents, they say, uh, what, what did you do in 2020? And whatever answer you want to give them in 10 or 30 years time, just do that today. And that will literally clear your mind because as long as you can give them an answer in 10 to 30 years time that you're gonna be happy with, just say, you know what, we just stuck together and we got through it. You know what, I, I, got, I became an activist and I really supported this. You know what, we just doubled down on our business to make sure we, we didn't let go of anyone and we made sure all of our teams were well taken care of. Whatever answer you, you wanna give in 10, 20 years time, that question will give you so much clarity and that will be the thing that pulls you through this time rather than you feeling like you're pushing through it. Rule number four, be humble. Humility means to be honest. It's like the ability to say, this is what this person deserves credit for, and this is what I deserve credit yeah, for, yeah, and this yeah. is what this person, it's like, it's kind of like when you write the uh, acknowledgements of your book, mm -hmm. right? You, mm -hmm. you write, yeah, yeah. I mean, you've, and, I, and I remember doing that process and really thinking about like, who's helped this book in different ways? And everyone gets their line in the acknowledgement who's made a difference. Now, your name goes on the front cover because you wrote the book. <laughs> yeah. Like you want everyone to receive the credit to the degree they merit it. Yes. And so you never want someone to feel like they didn't receive as much credit as they deserve. And at the same time, you don't wanna give someone more credit than they deserve. Mm -hmm. The point of credit is to give it where credit's <clears throat> due. Right. And so for me, that's honesty, that's humility. Uh, arrogance and pride is when you start to feel like only you did it on your own. And we all know that's just not true. Like, I can't say I did it all on my own. I, I just, I can't anyway, I definitely can't say that. And I can't say it was all other people. 
And so that is the, that's where honesty and humility, right. I think, live together. Hey everyone, I have been reading a bit from my friend's book, Evan Carmichael, Built to Serve, and I wanted to share this with you. So according to a study by Carnegie Mellon University, people with supportive spouses are more likely to give themselves the chance to succeed. They studied 163 married couples and found that people with supportive spouses were more likely to take on potentially rewarding challenges. Those who accepted challenges experienced more personal growth, happiness, and psychological well-being. Now, I can truly say that I've experienced that in my life. When I first met my wife, I was just starting out. I had never released a video. I hadn't created any content. And she was such an important part of feeling supported on that journey. So whether you're in a relationship, whether you're dating, whether you're married, or even if you're single, being supported by friends and a strong community is important. Uh, Built to Serve by Ellen Carmichael, great book on how you can find your purpose and also on reminding us that we can all make a difference in the world. Thanks, Evan. Rule number five, plan for a commute. Either you're someone who finds it hard to get motivated and productive and be effective throughout the day. You get distracted or stuck or lost. Or maybe you're someone who's ticking off everything from your to-do list, but are feeling drained, fatigued, and dissatisfied at the end of the day. If either of those are you, this is the video to watch. The first piece of advice I'm going to give you is really simple. Plan for a commute. Now, for those of you that are working from home, you may be wondering, this doesn't apply to me, Jay. Well, actually it does. What I find is that if you create a 10 to 15 minute commute in your day, and instead of diving straight into work, waking up out of your bed, walking to your kitchen table, you actually take a walk around the block. You're basically tricking your mind to feel like you're going somewhere. One of the reasons why we're all feeling so encaged and so enclosed is because we don't feel like we're changing environment. We don't feel like we're moving from place to place like we were before. So if that's your case, I want to make sure that you find 10 minutes at the beginning and the end of the day to go to work and come back from work and use that as time to actually dive into a podcast, an audiobook, or a blink on Blinkist, whatever works for you to give yourself some time to prepare for work. Rule number six, read and learn. Now, I didn't always love reading. When I was growing up, I used to love playing video games. I used to love playing sports. I used to like listening to music and maybe playing around with a few instruments when I could, but I didn't always love reading. And now I realize it's because I was always exposed to lots of fiction books. At school, we were taught to read fiction books. At college, it was all about fiction books. And I realized for me, I really gravitated towards non-fiction books autobiographies, biographies, and self-help books. I grew up in a house where my father was either reading the Bhagavad Gita, a book by Deepak Chopra, Jim Rohn, or Tony Robbins, and so I was surrounded by these wisdom books, and that's where I found my love for reading, learning, and growing. One of the things I fell in love with about non-fiction books is that you didn't just read them, you could study them, you could analyze them, you could extrapolate lessons and practical action steps that would transform your life. And I really feel that I've been a student of these books for over the last 16 to 18 years of my life and they have made a huge difference. I absolutely love reading biographies and autobiographies. One of my favorite biographies is by Walter Isaacson and it's Steve Jobs' biography. If you haven't read it, you have to go and check it out. And again, when I typed it on Blinkist, I was so happy to see that there's such an incredible breakdown of one of my favorite books. The three P's methodology is fantastic for biographies and autobiographies because it helps you learn from people. I think it's so important to learn from the lives of people that inspire us, the people that we admire, the people that we're intrigued by, because guess what? At one point you're going to fail just like them and then you can think about what they did. At one point, you're going to have things happen to you that you didn't plan for, and you'll need to know how to deal with uncertainty and discomfort just like they did. Rule number seven, prepare the night before. Decision fatigue. Now, I want you to take a moment to just jot down what are the decisions you make every morning before you've got out of bed, 
before you get into your commute or start your work day. Chances are you spend a lot of time thinking about what to wear, what to eat that morning. You might even think about what to eat for lunch, what to eat for dinner. You might be wondering around what movie you're going to watch tonight, what episode of which show you're going to watch when you get back. You may even be thinking about what meeting do I have? What person do I have to connect with today? What do I even have to do today? These are very common things for a lot of us. The concept of decision fatigue teaches us that so many of us are making so many insignificant decisions in the morning that by the time we start our work day, we're already exhausted from making decisions. We overthink about the smaller things that should be easy, and now we have no energy for the bigger things that do require our attention and our awareness. I want you to create a table of decisions to make the night before and decisions to make the day of. What that's going to help you do is give you something to focus on the night before so that you can be prepared and well ahead of schedule before the next day, and be really clear about what you can only do on that day. Now, the night before, you want to be doing that either at the end of your workday or just after dinner. The reason is because at the end of your workday, you can set yourself up for success the next day. For those of you that want to leave it till after dinner, the reason why I say after is because we make better decisions when we're eaten and when we've nourished. So what we're essentially doing with decision fatigue is that we're stopping ourselves from overthinking about the smaller, irrelevant to some degree, insignificant decisions to the more significant decisions. Now, I'm not saying that eating food is not important. I'm not saying that what you wear every day is not important. I take pride in what I eat and what I wear, but when I've meal prepped, when I've made a plan a week in advance, when I've made it simple for myself, my brain gets capacity and space to make these big decisions. A really great example of this is Mark Zuckerberg, Barack Obama, and others who've been known to wear the same suits or the same clothes again and again on repeat. Now, this is something I personally had first-hand experience of living as a monk. Every day we woke up and we wore robes. We had two sets, one to wear, one to wash. It simplified that energy in the morning. Now today, of course, I don't wear robes, I'm not a monk anymore, and I have a wardrobe that I enjoy, but inside of it, I have many different things, but I have them in many different colors. That way, I still have somewhat of a uniform that simplifies that, or I make a decision the night before. Rule number eight, question your beliefs. I think the first thing we have to do with beliefs is you have to realize everyone has them. It's not like you don't have beliefs just because you don't know what they are. Everyone has beliefs that they're currently living with. And I think life is about unlearning the beliefs you have and questioning the beliefs you have mm. and then creating new ones. So the first thing I do with beliefs. Unlearning. Yeah. From the beginning. From the beginning. What the if your parents had the answers and the way and the religion and this? Should we be questioning it all? I think we should question it because questioning, the okay, questions are the most powerful invention oh, yeah. in the world because questions either strengthen or weaken a belief oh. based on the information. So questions aren't always from a place of doubt and cynicism and trying to find a weakness. Questions are a sincere request to figure out something. Like when we're sitting in these interviews, you're not sitting there trying to like, be cynical or be, you want to help yourself and people who are listening yes. and watching. And so that's a question, first of all. A question is not to cat someone off guard. A question is not to put someone down. A question is not to mislead people. A question is to uplift yourself and others. And when you ask a question in that way, the answer can either strengthen a belief you already have or weaken it mm -hmm. or introduce you to a new one. We have defined our identity by our beliefs. So imagine you're on one of these assault courses and you're on this rope and you're being told to swing to the next rope. But in order to catch the next rope, you need to let go of this rope. But you're scared because this rope is currently your safety. So your current belief is your safety. And when you have to consider holding on to another belief and to entertain both together, you're scared that if that one doesn't hold, I'm basically gonna fall. So people are scared that their belief is currently their safety net. And so even if it's wrong, it still makes them feel safe and they feel comfortable and we don't want to feel uncomfortable. So we'd rather hold on to that safety net, right? So the only way to do it. How do we get comfortable with questioning our beliefs but not being like holding on to nothing? Well, realizing that you don't have to change your mind or you don't have to leave what you think in order to entertain or yeah. be curious explore. about anything yeah. and explore. Like, explore and experimenting and experiencing 
can either strengthen the belief you have or help you find a new one. But you have to do that middle three E's of explore, mm -hmm. exploring, experimenting, and experiencing. Yeah. And the problem is that we are just theoretically thinking, we're not experiencing the benefit. Rule number nine, take a break. I want you to start creating a five minute gap between each and every meeting in your schedule. So if a meeting finishes at 10 a.m., the next one starts at 10.05. I don't want you to schedule any meetings back to back from this point onwards. You may think five minutes is not a lot of time, but that five minute gap can be life changing. Here's how. When you take out time between each meeting, you get that really important time to decompress and prepare for the next meeting. You're now not shifting your energy from one thing to another thing to another thing straight away and feeling like you're just stressed in between, not even getting time to comprehend what the next meeting is about. I've got five habits for you that you can do across five minutes that are going to keep you feeling productive, effective, and focus on your well being throughout the day. The first one is water. It is so important that we take a moment to rehydrate between meetings. It's so important to stay hydrated because we need to be drinking around two to three liters a day. And when we're doing that, it boosts our brain function, it allows us to feel clearer, it's fantastic for making us feel energized throughout the day. The second thing you're going to do in your five minute gap is walk around. This could be in your bedroom, in your kitchen, wherever you get a moment it's really, really important to get moving. So many of us are feeling so stagnant and stuck at the moment because we're sitting at our desks all day long. We no longer have a lunch to get up to or a meeting on the other side of our offices to meet someone. We're in the same place. This is causing a lot of issues with our posture, the way our body feels, the way our muscles are. It's not natural for us to be locked into a sitting position throughout the whole day. The third is to watch. By watch, I mean watch a view a window, look out of a window, look into the sky, take a step out for a moment and get some fresh air. It's so important that we look out into the distance. We've got so used to just staring at screens and devices and books and schedules that are right up in our face that we're not giving our eyes the opportunity to look out into the distance. Now this fourth one's a little more interesting and you may need a little bit more time for it, but it's the idea of wonder. Allow your mind to wonder, allow it to think of a new idea, to be creative, to think about something unrelated. This is where creativity comes from. This is where that feeling comes from, that you're innovating, that you're allowing your mind to connect dots that otherwise you might seem as disconnected. And the fifth and final thing that you can do in those five minutes is to wind down. And one of the best ways to wind down is through your breath. Allow yourself a few moments to breathe in for the same amount of time as you breathe out. A very simple way to do this is breathe in for a count of one to four and breathe out for a count of one to four. How many of you ever felt that your mind is ahead of your body? Your mind is racing around, but your body feels sluggish and tired. If you want to bring your body and mind back into sync, back into alignment, you want to breathe in and breathe out for the same amount of time. Doing this breathing practice allows you to walk in with a clear mind, with a relaxed body, and reduces your anxiety throughout the day. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is have fun. Okay. How much are you going to put on me? Is there a need? Like, when would you put this on in the day? I like cleansing my face at night. Is it cold? Yeah, it's very cold. Cleansing is actually meant to be a very um, mindful activity. Okay, go on. Make it mindful. Just be quiet. Would you, uh, will you do this for me every day when we're at home? Absolutely not. Are you doing it just for the video? Just for the video. There you go. Lovely. All right. You look brand new. Okay, so what do we do now? So now we have to get a hose. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a hose. Oh, it's so cold. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. You look great. Thank that you. kind of feels like it's off. Is it actually off? Yeah, it's off enough. How's it off? <laughs> yeah, but now you How is that now off? you dry it. Ready? How does it feel? It feels really nice. Does it? I feel really Did refreshed. it smell nice? I feel refreshed. 
Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week? The science says that when you just watch a video, you get motivated, you get inspired, you have a 35% chance of following through on your goals. 35%, that's not enough. That's not enough just to get motivated. Believe Nation, we're here, you're here. The today matters, you're an action taker. When you commit to a plan of action of when and how you're gonna follow through, when you write it down, you have a 91% chance of following through. And when you commit publicly to somebody else, it jumps to 95% chance. From 30 something percent to 95% chance of you following through. Believe Nation, we need to make this happen. So question of the day, your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action specific for the next week. Put it down in the comments below and I'm gonna show on screen sometime next week to celebrate you. At 18, I was really fortunate when I met a monk and this monk was invited to speak and I kind of just went because one of my friends forced me to. At that time, I was listening to CEOs and entrepreneurs and business people and marketers who, who I thought that's what I was aspiring to be like. And then I hear this monk and he captivated me like no one had ever captivated me before. It was like staring at the most beautiful woman on the planet. You know, I was completely fixated on him and his message. See, we live in echo chambers. We're just surrounded by the same thinking. How often do you bump into a monk? You know, it just doesn't happen. You don't have, no one has a dinner party and goes, oh yeah, we just invited the monk, you know, from town, like the local monk. Like no one ever does that. And so you, we meet people who are just like us most of the time. And we talk about this in business all the time. If you want to be a billionaire, spend time with billionaires. If you want to be a millionaire, spend time with millionaires. If you want to be a tech startup, spend time with, you know, that's, that's the common rhetoric that we hear all the time. But what if you want to find purpose and master the mind? There's no one better than a monk who's mastered the mind. So, so for me, the first step is just opening yourself up to new experiences and new role models. Because most of us can't see ourselves in people, so then we try and fit ourselves into the boxes that we do see. And, and I mean, there's this beautiful quote that I, I've been saying it everywhere and I wish I wrote it, but I didn't. So it's by a philosopher and writer named Cooley. And he said that today, I'm not what I think I am, I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. Right, and just let that blow your mind for a moment. It's, uh, it's so powerful. I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. So we live in this perception of a perception of ourselves. Hence, my identity is made by what my parents think I should be. My identity is made up by what my college or university thinks I should achieve. While you're living in that bubble and that echo chamber, getting to what you really want to do is impossible because maybe that just doesn't fit. And I think so many people feel that way today, that they don't fit into the current education system. They don't fit with the three or four or five careers that you're taught exist. So that process of self-excavation and actualization first requires being exposed. You can't be what you can't see. If I never saw a monk, I would never have wanted to be a monk. If I never meet a billionaire, I wouldn't want to be one because I wouldn't know what that feels like. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it takes. And, and I think that's the biggest challenge of our society, that we're not exposed. So that's the first step, being exposed to unique experiences and role models. Second step is finding that experience or role model that you're passionate about. And exactly like you said, taking it seriously, shadow them, network with them, spend time with them, observe them, even from afar. It takes that observation, being addicted to observing that person's lifestyle. And then the third step is going yes or no. Does that work for me? Not everyone who's gonna go off and become a monk is gonna feel like the way I did, and that's cool. But not everyone is gonna go and follow and shadow a billionaire and go, that's exactly the lifestyle I want. They may want the result, but do they want the hard work that goes with it? And so for me, that's the third step. It's observing, focusing, shadowing, getting as close to the process of that individual and then going yes or no. Do I want that process? Not do I want the result? Mm. Everyone wants to be that monk who's fully enlightened, you know, can walk through, has an incredible aura that people just gravitate towards. But when you realize he has to wake up at 2 a.m. every day and sleeps about four to six hours, you're like, ah, you know, I don't wanna do that. <laughs> that. That doesn't sound like me. In the middle of 2009, he was the software engineer that no one wanted to hire. He had 12 years of experience at Yahoo, but he was rejected by Facebook and then rejected by Twitter. 
He'd been to a great university. He had a great CV. But he decided to team up with one of his alumni members at Yahoo and started to create an app and focus on the startup space. In five years time, he sold that app for $19 billion to Facebook. Believe it or not, that was Brian Acton, the co-founder of WhatsApp. When he was rejected from Facebook, he said it was a great opportunity to connect with some fantastic people. I look forward to life's next adventure. When he was rejected by Twitter, he responded by saying, worked out, it was quite a long commute. It's so interesting to see that someone rejected from two of the top internet companies actually responded with humor and actually responded with positivity. This lady was diagnosed with clinical depression. Her marriage had failed and she was jobless with a dependent child. She was on a four hour delayed train journey from Manchester to London when she came up with this idea and she started to write this book about this wizard. And as she started writing, she then finished her manuscript, took it to 12 publishers and was rejected by all 12. Believe it or not, that's J.K. Rowling. This man watched his first company crumble. He was a Harvard University dropout and his first company's demo didn't even work. He went on to build Microsoft. His name's Bill Gates. Therefore, failure is just a sign that we need to widen our scope. We need to be ready and build ourselves up for the next level. Actually, what we end up achieving is far greater than what we'd envisioned for ourselves. And this divine plan, this orchestration can't be happening without this intervention that occurs because if we had it our way, we'd just settle. We'd just accept what we thought was our goal, what we thought we were chasing. But actually, I've noticed that when you don't get that, later down the line, you look back and you reflect and realize that what you've gained is so much greater. Failures are only failures when we don't learn from them because when we learn from them, they become lessons and we actually extrapolate all of these teachings and actually get more insight into how we can improve the way we work and how we can actually drive with a different energy. The challenge we have is that we only talk about people's failures when they succeed and that's why they become this taboo or we feel like their failures never happened. We need to share these stories earlier. We need to bring out these stories and experiences on the journey so that people who are on the journey can actually follow in those footsteps. And that's why Steve Jobs said you can't connect the dots moving forward. You only can when you're looking backwards. Fred Smith was an undergraduate at Yale University in 1965. As part of his coursework, he wrote an economics paper exploring the transportation of goods in the United States. It's how things get delivered to you and me. He found that shippers were transporting large packages and items either via truck or through passenger airplanes. He thought he had a more efficient method. He wrote a last minute paper, as you do, about how a company transporting small items via a plane would be a much better business model. Because he was rushed, he never really got around to explaining in the paper how that company would run and he ended up getting a C. The funny thing is, he still didn't give up and in 1971, he actually launched the company he was speaking about. But within three years of founding the company, Federal Express, as it was called, was actually on the verge of bankruptcy. They were losing over a million a month. That was because of rising fuel costs, competitors in the same market, and at its zenith, it was only worth about $5,000. Smith even made a final pitch to General Dynamics hoping for more funding and it was rejected. Most people at this point probably would have just shut down. Rejection, the grade C, losing a million a month. But Fred Smith had different ideas. Smith actually ended up flying to Las Vegas that weekend with all of what the company had, the $5,000. The Monday morning after, the company had $32,000 thanks to his blackjack skills. That money made it possible to cover fuel costs for just a few days more. Soon after the company was able to raise significant funds, he went around to multiple places to find sponsors, investors, people that believed in what he was trying to achieve as a service. The amazing thing is that he was creating a company that we all know today. It's called FedEx. It now operates in over 220 countries and has an annual revenue of over 45 
billion. The interesting lesson that we can learn here is that there were countless occasions in Fred Smith's life where he could have said, that's it, it's not working for me. He could have stopped when he got that C for the paper. He could have stopped when he was losing a million a month. He could have even stopped when he finally only had enough to just last a few more days. But he believed in his vision. He had belief, he had conviction about his idea and the process and the service that he was creating. And that's the lesson here. If you really want to achieve something, you'll find a way. And if you don't, you'll find excuses. Now it's incredible that we root for underdogs. It's incredible that we want underdogs to win. Why? Because we're used to wanting our team to win. We're used to wanting the best to win. We're used to wanting to associate ourselves with people who are successful, right? We never go, oh yeah, I know someone who plays for that really bad team. Like we don't say that, right? We say things like, oh, I know someone who plays for that really good team. I know someone who was MVP. I know someone who's the son or the daughter of the MVP. We try and associate or link ourselves to success. And when we do that, it in turn makes us feel more successful. It's one of the reasons why when your team wins, you say, we won, right? You say, we won. But when someone asks you, oh, how did your team do? And if they lost that day, you say, they lost. You rarely say, we lost. It's incredible how psychologically we distance ourselves from failure and we closen or liken ourselves to success. But the exception to that rule is the underdog. We all get excited by underdogs. We all get motivated by underdogs. We feel completely enamored by the story of the underdog. Prashant, underdogs are just simple-minded. They don't have expectations and don't have anything to prove to anybody. And Prashant, you've just hit the nail on the head. That's the principle I'm trying to get across. Actually, we should play like champions and train like underdogs. Why? Because the underdog works in a way not worrying about what anybody else thinks or believes. That gives you an edge. It gives you a phenomenal advantage. When you're not actually worried about what will people say, when you're not concerned by, am I going to fail? Am I going to look worse? Is what I'm doing not going to succeed? As an underdog, you don't let those things cloud your mind. You can focus in on the task at hand. See, when we become successful, even as underdogs, if we've risen to success, the biggest enemy of that success, the biggest Achilles heel, the biggest thing that can trip us up is not reconnecting to that feeling of an underdog. So no matter how much success you've achieved, no matter where you are, always remind yourself the mindset of an underdog is the mindset that nurtures talent, that nurtures success, that harnesses your true potential. What's the impact that you want to have on the world? I think you've, you've, you've said it so beautifully so many times and shared my vision, which is wonderful. And it's wonderful to know that we, we share the same thing. It's making wisdom go viral. There's an incredible study in 2017 that said the most successful people in the world, healthy, wealthy, and wise, choose education over entertainment. The impact I wanna have on the world is I wanna transform and revolutionize the entertainment industry so that it becomes educational without anyone knowing. So it's still completely entertaining. It's still like watching Netflix but you're learning about human behavior, the mind, neuroscience, and everything without even knowing you are. To me, that's the greatest win that we can have for our society. How many people are gonna quit watching Netflix and reading a book every night? I don't know. But if we can make that book come to life on Netflix, that's gonna change the world because that's what people are gonna consume. So for so long, media has been used to numb people, to, to switch people off. If we can use it to excite, elevate, enlighten people, not by just, not by like the cheesy way of like, oh, let's follow someone through their journey of enlightenment. It's not like that kind of stuff. I mean like really entertaining programming where you can learn by being entertained at the same time. If I can do that by changing the, the most powerful industry in the world, then I will feel that I've had some, some what of an impact because that way I think we'll reach the world without having to get everyone to change their habits too much. Uh, my, my thing is how do we meet people where they are and, and really deliver a message and a powerful expression of love. And to me, that's the highest form of compassion. The highest form of empathy, love and compassion is to meet people where they already are rather than expecting them to change. Let me tell you about this girl called Cleo. I think you might know someone like her too. 
She had the dream of becoming a model. She said she was going to move to LA to pursue it seriously. She took care of herself, at least her body well. Someone told me she did ads for L'Oreal. She had so many followers on Instagram who all loved her. Within a minute of her posting a picture, there would be hundreds and hundreds of comments, all telling her how beautiful she was, how good she looked, comment after comment, like after like. She was a real entertainer. She was always making everyone laugh. I remember every guy wanted her number, but, but she kept to herself. She just had this infectious energy. She got along with everyone. She was always the life of the party. She was never seen in the same outfit twice. Boxes and boxes of Amazon Prime. On Instagram, she was the perfect girl with the perfect life. The perfect world with the perfect guys. But nothing's perfect, right? It seemed like she was always having the best time with her friends, always traveling new experiences and so many great stories to share until people started to notice. I think she lived like two lives. No one really knew her inside. She had everyone to text, but no one to talk to. Everyone to follow, but no one to walk with. When the phone was up, her world was a stage. When it was down, her reality came. She had an invite to every event, but still felt lonely. She had all the friends in the world, but still felt no one really knows me. She was going through pain, but never showed that side. It was something she hid from the world. Or maybe we just never asked. She had masked her sadness with what looked like the ideal life. She was always flying high in the air, but felt low inside. Her inbox was always full, but she felt empty within. She was happy on the outside, but struggling with depression and anxiety. She had an addiction that everyone called a lifestyle, but she was struggling with mental health but people were just occupied by her physical appearance. See, people think depression is sadness. People think depression is crying. People think depression is being quiet. Depression is when we smile, but we want to cry. It's when we talk, but we want to be quiet. It's when we pretend like we're happy, but we're not. Depression is not always obvious. She drank to drown her pain, but the pain learned how to swim. She was sick of crying, tired of trying, smiling, but inside she was dying. It's amazing how we can think we know someone and still not know them at all. I don't think we understand how stressful it is to explain what's going on in your head when you don't even understand yourself. We use filters to lighten our photos whilst we carry the heavy weight of stress. Remember, it's okay to have highlight reels, but make sure someone knows how you really feel. It's okay to use FaceTime, but make sure you spend quality time face to face. It's okay to have followers, but make sure you have true friends. Don't live for the approval of others. Document the moments you're most in love with yourself, not just the moments you think people will love the most. When someone doesn't post for a few days, we ask if they're okay. When someone posts every day, we assume they are. Tell people you love them. Be a trustworthy friend. Tell them that they matter. Tell them that they've survived a lot and they're ready to thrive now. People who care will ask how you're doing. People who love you will wait till you tell the truth. And that's why Robin Williams said, I used to think that the worst thing in life was to end up alone. It's not. The worst thing in life is to end up with people who make you feel alone. Something that happens is you have to surround yourself by peers in a space too who understand you and don't see you as competition. And that's really hard and it's like a fine line. I genuinely believe that collaboration wins always. So I, my whole approach to most things has always been, hey, I want to collaborate with you. Whether I'm bigger on social media or smaller on social media, I'm just like, I just want to work together because I think that's going to win long term for all of us. Both not just in terms of success and numbers, but more in terms of I want to be friends with you. And so I reach out regularly to people that I admire in different ways. And I reach out to them and say, hey, I'd love to get to know you. 
I'd love to learn from you. I'd love to connect. I'd love to be a friend. Like, not I'd love to for you to teach me how you do this. And if that comes naturally from that relationship, amazing. If it never evolves into that, I've just got a great friend who now gets me. So I try and make friends in two areas. One is in an area of people who understand my life because I feel the conversations you can have with someone who does exactly what you do are just so great because they already get you, right? And uh, someone that I had on my podcast lately, her name's Lily Singh, Superwoman. Uh, she's become a recent friend. She's been incredibly and is incredibly successful on social media. She's using her platform for doing amazing good in the world. And she was someone I reached out to because I was just like, hey, like you've been doing all of this for a while. You started on YouTube a lot longer than I did. And I would just love to connect from you and hear from you. And she's become an incredible friend and we've just been sharing ideas and learning together. And it's like, that relationship's awesome. And then at the same time, I'm trying to find people who are not in media. So I still have friendships with the monks back in India. And I just spent January in India for a month. I was meditating again for, for roughly about 21 days. And I have them in my life because they remind me of like the roots and they remind me of the truths that bring me back. So I kind of like both. I love people who totally get my space. And usually those are people I reach out to. And then I love having my roots down. So most of my inner circle now is from people I've reached out to, or they become people who've been reaching out to me for a long, long time, and have been consistently reaching out to me asking for nothing. The challenge is that we think things come with emotions. Feelings. We think things come with feelings and emotions, and guess what they don't. So if you chase money. Well, they might for a moment, right? Or they won't. I don't think they even do. It's, a false sense it's of such feeling. a false sense of feeling. I don't. Uh -huh. Maybe for a moment, but it's so short-lived that it's it's not even worth counting almost. Mm -hmm. So it's like when you when you think that I'm chasing money. Guess what? You will get money. Yep. And that's great. Money is really important. Money is a really important resource. But guess what? Money is not now going to fill that gap, that void, that feeling, that emotion that you're missing in your life. What are and most so, people missing? We're missing a deep sense of love. I think, I think the biggest need in the world, as we've heard many times before from all the ancient texts, they, they, they summarize it like this, to love and be loved. Like that is the need of humanity, to love and be loved. And when we don't experience that, we then start looking for status. We then start looking for money. Then we then start looking for recognition. To, to help us give the feeling of false sense of love. Correct. And the challenge is because most of us didn't experience that from our parents, and this is the key thing, what we crave in life is what we did or didn't get from our parents. Mm -hmm. What our parents did give us is what we continue to crave, or what they didn't give us is what we continue to crave. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that most people's love languages that they chase are things that their parents didn't give them. So if their parents didn't give them time, they now crave everyone's time. If their parents didn't give them gifts, gifts they crave gifts. If their parents didn't give them acts of service, they, they're craving those acts of service. So it's because of our childhood. And if we don't learn to process all of that experience, which most people never get the time to do, and, and I empathize with that because I've had to go through that. I've seen me repeating my parents' patterns. Mm. I've what seen was the me, thing you were craving? So I would crave a big thing for me was I would crave surprises and gifts because that's your thing. Yeah, yeah. that's my thing. Still is your thing. It's still my thing. Yeah. And and I did your parents not do that for you? No, they did. A, my mom did a lot of it. That's why so, you still crave. Correct. It. So my mom would always every year on my birthday, she'd always surprise me with the one thing I wanted. And I wasn't spoiled growing up. I didn't yeah, have a yeah. lot growing up. But she would get that one thing, whether it was like a Power Rangers toy right. or whether it was whatever it was. You yeah. know, something. You Video know, game. Yeah. Or something thing like. is, you want as a kids, right? And she would always surprise me with that. And that became so deep rooted. Now I'll give you an example. When I then married my wife, you just expect people to know that. That they're gonna do the same thing. Totally. And, and so she now- She didn't you, do that. No, because I'm expecting my wife to be like my mom in the sense of I expected a surprise or show me love in the same way. Uh -huh. And she doesn't know that. She's not a mind reader. I can't explain, expect her to know that. So it took communication. It took yeah. time for me to explain that. So anyway, th I think that's where it stems from. That desire, it doesn't come from any, you can say it comes from society and education. Of course it does. But I think the deepest place it comes is what your parents did or didn't give you. Mm -hmm. That's that's where yeah. it comes from. Yeah. A young boy once asked his teacher, what's the difference between I like you and I love you? The teacher beautifully answered, well, it's like a flower. If you like a flower, 
you pluck it. But if you love a flower, you water it and nurture it daily and watch it grow. There is such a thin line between like and love. And because of it, we make so many mistakes in our relationships. When we want something in the moment, we take it and don't think any further. We do whatever we want to get that feeling of pleasure, not realizing that we're neither satisfied by that pleasure and nor will that thing last. When we pluck a flower, not only will that flower die, but we can't experience it for any longer than that moment. When you water it and take care of it daily, you can experience it forever. We've been wired towards an instant gratification, instant pleasure mindset. All of the adverts that we see, whether they're online or offline, are geared to driving us towards making instant decisions for instant promises of pleasure. The catch is, not only does that instant pleasure not satisfy us, the feeling doesn't last. We're so used to seeing all the strap lines and headlines on the internet. Learn this language in five minutes. Get the ideal body in 10 minutes a day. Become a millionaire in 12 months. Now all of these sound brilliant, right? The problem is, they're not real. They're not true. They're false promises. The reason why it works is because it appeals to one of the most basic human desires. Situational improvement without major resource investment. Of course you can pick up a few words in another language or shed a few pounds of weight if that was your goal. Or maybe you will make a little bit more money. But real knowledge, real awareness, real fitness, real business, all of these things take time. Real relationships, real connection, real purpose takes time. Naturally, the internet headlines focus on the short term instead of the long term. Because most of us would never click on something if it said, learn a language in five years with dedicated daily practice. We wouldn't click on something that said, here is the one hour workout that you need to do every single day. And we wouldn't click on the one that said, if you want to be a millionaire, here are the 10 failures that you'll go through in year one, how broke you might be by year three, and you may not even make it by year nine. The important lesson here is, if you want meaning, if you want purpose, if you want fulfillment, those things take time. You talked about the fear of fear and how you had to learn to let go of your fear of fear. What does it actually mean, letting go of the fear of fear? Yeah, so I talk about how we fear the wrong things. What do we fear? So most of us are fearful of how our friends are reacting, what's happening on social media, and what's the random bit of news that we heard. None of it is fact-based. That's one of the biggest issues that we have. It's worry-based. It's worry-based, and it's also imagination-based. So we become fiction writers. We've all watched too many movies. Now we start writing these beautiful movies in our head. We're not beautiful, scary movies in our head of what may happen. So our imagination, and Seneca said it best, we suffer twice. One in reality and one in imagination. Mm. Right, we suffer twice. And this is the biggest- What actually happens to us. Totally. And then the story we continue to tell ourselves. Totally, now there's this incredible study in the book that I have to talk about. So they took monks and they took non-monks and they- They competed against each other. They (laughs) competed against each other, literally. So they put this plate where you experience heat. And so what happens is the non-monks touch this plate. Now this plate heats up gradually, softly, Uh and then at one point it gets really hot for 10 seconds and it cools down. And so what happened is that when the non-monks touched it, the anxiety and pressure and stress in their brain just triggered straight away, even though it wasn't that hot. It wasn't hot. It it was heating, but it wasn't hot to do anything major to you. But the anxiety and stress in imagination or in anticipation went through the roof in the non-monks. Now this is what's fascinating. When the monks touched it, they showed that it didn't feel anything as it rose, but as it got to its highest, they felt physical pain, but they showed no trigger of emotional pain because they did not assign any emotional element to that pain. So my point with that is, you can look at the news right now and you can get scared straight away and get in complete freeze mode, feeling stuck, paralyzed, whatever it is, because what you're now doing is you're creating a story of what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. 
And that story. And you can cause sickness in yourself. You can cause sickness just by inside the story, yourself. Not actually the reality. The, the, the facts of the disease hitting you or something happening physically to you. Totally. And that story, again, can be used positively. So your story may actually be true. But if it's going right. to be true, now you can prepare. Mm. And that shifts you away from being scared because now you're preparing. Yes. And so the real You can be answer, confident because you prepared. Exactly. And so we should be shifting our fear energy into preparation energy. Because what fear does is it keeps you locked there, mm. right? We just feel stuck. I'll give you an example. Like when you were preparing for big games, when you used yes. to play in the NFL, yes. right? And you're playing American football against some of the biggest athletes in the world. It's like you can either sit there and be scared that you're gonna play this game on the weekend, uh -huh. or you can prepare. And yeah. your confidence is in the preparation. So when people go, how do I feel confident right now? Are you preparing? Are you putting the reps? Are you putting the reps? Yeah. Are you building your immunity? Mm -hmm. Are you taking your vitamins? Are you drinking lots of water? Are you drinking lots of water? Are you taking the steps that are needed to prepare for whatever's coming? You will feel more confident that way. Yeah. There are sometimes when I'm with a social media person who says something really useful for my roots. And there's someone down when I'm with roots and they say something else. And there's a great story actually about when the prime minister of India, Modi, he visited Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg interviewed him at Facebook at the headquarters. And Mark Zuckerberg told a story. He said that when he was struggling with the direction of Facebook in 2009, he went up to his mentor to ask a question. Now, Mark Zuckerberg's mentor happened to be Steve Jobs. And so he went up to Steve Jobs and he said, Steve, I'm struggling with the direction of Facebook. What do I do? And at that time, you know, I mean, Steve Jobs is Steve Jobs. He could have said anything mm -hmm. and it would have made sense. But, you know, he could have said, go and meet a venture capitalist. He could have said, go and meet an investor. He could have said, go and meet a tech company. He could have said, I'll tell you what to do. Instead, he said, I think you need to go to India and spend some time in an ashram, a monastery in India with monks. And he goes, when you do that, you'll find the answer of what you want to do. And to me, that is exactly why the people that are most successful in this world are successful, because they surround themselves with people who have differing beliefs. And MIT did a research study on this. They found that people who are more innovative and creative in an organization knew people who didn't know each other. So when you know people who all know each other, you end up with the same answer, the same belief and confirmation bias exists, mm -hmm. and you just keep building that echo chamber. Whereas if you've got two people who don't agree and you get a checking system, then you can trust your gut and go with what you believe. So I think I try and move away from having people around me. And it's not just yes men or yes women. It's about, it's not just about that. It's about building a circle of people, like you said, that want different things for you and knowing what they want for you. So when I'm with my mom, all my mom cares about is my health, <laughs> right? My mom does not care how successful I am, how many videos I have, how many people I help, even that. And my mom will get over that. She's like, how's your health? Like, are you taking care of yourself? Are you sleeping well? Are you eating well? Like, that's my mom. And it's like, if I go and I measure everything, most of that, that's wrong. But if I know that that's what my mom wants for me, that's beautiful. That's what I get from her. And she'll take care of that. And same, you know, everyone plays a different role in your life. Don't expect everyone to play the role you want and don't expect everyone to play the same role. Recognize that everyone's playing their role in your life and let them play it. That's what makes a good movie. If everyone played the same role in a movie, it'd be boring. Very boring. Right? Right. Every day we recharge our phones, but we forget to recharge ourselves. Let's just say we slept well the night before, which means we start our day with 100% charge. When we wake up in the morning, we roll over and 80% of us check our smartphones before we brush our teeth. We scroll through social media, we browse through emails. That takes away 10% of our energy. Let's say we now have 90% charge left. We then commute to work. We spend our day in the office, in meetings, interacting with colleagues, finishing off projects and assignments we now have 40% charge left. On the way home, we commute through traffic or on the train, and that takes away another, let's say 10%. We now have 30% charge left. We come home and switch on Netflix, talk to someone about what our day was like, and sometimes we lose another 10%. We now have 20% charge left. At 20% on our phones, usually the charge bar goes red. We get an alert. We get a message that tells us that we only have 20% battery left. 
The question is, do we notice when our charge is at 20% or 10%? There are always signs from our bodies, our brains, our minds. But are we tuned in? One of the best things we can do to recharge is to exercise. The hardest part of any workout is actually the 15 minutes leading up to it. We come up with 15 reasons why we don't want to sweat and we change our mind 15 different times. CNN reports that when you work out, your brain creates more serotonin, which sends messages to your nervous system of happiness and well-being. Working out for 30 to 40 minutes every day can recharge our battery by 20%. Meditation is an incredible way to recharge our batteries. Exactly what the gym does for the body, meditation can do for the mind. Meditation gives us downtime, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Meditation also directly impacts your entire nervous system by reducing your body's productions of stress-related chemicals such as cortisol. Meditation is a great way to recharge and can take you back up 20%. We've all heard about incredible morning routines, but the one thing that can make a huge difference to your recharge is your evening routine. 35% of us are not getting the recommended seven hours of sleep per night. Remember, every body and mind is different. Make sure you find the amount of time you need to get that serious battery recharge. And the 75-year study by Harvard found that beyond anything, the real sense check for happiness and meaning in life was relationships, connections, interactions with depth that are fulfilling and full of joy. Making time for deep, meaningful interactions every day can give the recharge our battery seriously needs. What if we've recharged ourselves as much as we recharge our phones. Because if we don't, we'll end up like one of our phones in the bottom of some drawer in our home. Here's the shocking truth about loneliness. This is why we need to take it more seriously. Surveys show one out of three adults are lonely and the health impacts of loneliness are shocking. Studies have shown that people who are lonely are 50% more likely to die before their time. Researchers show that loneliness is as damaging to our health as not smoking one, not two, but 15 cigarettes per day. Only around half of Americans say they have meaningful face-to-face -face interactions with a loved one, family or friend every single day. Members of Generation Z say they are the loneliest generation and experience more health problems as a result of it. Loneliness was also linked with less physical activity, compulsive use of digital technology, and not being able to share our problems with others. In a study of 20,000 adults, 54% say that they don't know one person that knows them well. Additionally, 56% of people said that the people they surround themselves with are not necessarily with them. And approximately 40% said that they lack companionship, don't have meaningful relationships, and feel isolated. All of us have been in a crowd but felt lonely. All of us have been invited to a party but wanted to leave. All of us have likes on social media but don't feel loved in real life. So many of us can get comments on our posts but can't get a friend to call us back. Loneliness is real, so here's what we have to do. After studying over 2,500 consumers over six years, research found that people that see material possessions as a sign of success felt more lonely. Investing our money in experience rather than things is a great way of breaking the loneliness and materialism cycle. Schedule a time each day to talk to a friend. Take a class to learn something new. Volunteer to deepen your sense of purpose. Spend time with people who look more like your future than your past. The mental health charity Mind cites two factors that can cause loneliness. Someone either not having enough social contact or, more interestingly, being surrounded by people but not feeling understood, loved or cared for. Notice, it's not just being around people but being understood. It's not just being invited and present 
of feeling like you're contributing. Loneliness really comes then from a lack of significance or lack of worth and what you bring to the table and what value you truly offer. Lonely is not being alone. It's the feeling that no one loves you. So start by loving yourself. I read an incredible study that changed the way I create and think. And it said that the human mind can't be logical and creative at the same time. How many of you have ever walked from a highly creative brainstorm where you were fueled with passion and then had to talk about numbers and business and, right? It's tough, right? Anyone ever found that quite difficult? It's quite challenging and the mind's like trying to run from one side of the brain to the other side of the brain. So what I do is I create in depth. So I go really deep into my creation and then I go really deep into everything else that I have to do. So before I went to India, I created my content in advance. And so when I was in India, I was able to really switch off. So the beauty of being able to be in India for 21 or 30 days, or wherever I am in the world for that matter, I'm then not having to think of creativity as stress or pressure. I'm able to do creativity as a form of passion and service. And so when I was in India, I was able to not look at Instagram. I was able to not look at Facebook. I was able to completely switch off for 21 days when I was there earlier in January. And I started my year in the way I wanted to. So I was meditating for eight hours a day. I was spending time with my teachers who are mind-blowing and incredible and trying to learn from them and taking knowledge and wisdom from them and continuously praying to be of more service this year and make a difference this year. So that's how I chose to spend my January. And I had so many people saying to me, they were just like, Jay, it's January. Things are going well in your career. How can you take 21 days off? Right, that pressure, that noise. I was like, things are going good for you. How can you take time off? I was like, things are going good because I'm doing this. Right, like, you know, I had one of my teachers that has kept saying to me for years, he goes, if you want to move three steps forward, you have to go three steps deep. And so if I'm not going forward, I know it's because I haven't gone deep. So for me, that's a big priority for me. And that's what I try and do when I'm, not, I try and do that every day, but I also believe in immersive experiences. So a lot of us today, we live in this world, which is like 10 minutes a day. Do it for 10 minutes a day, everything will be great. And that is great. There's nothing wrong with that. But imagine you spent with a boy or a girl, your partner, whoever it was, someone that you just started dating. Imagine you spent 10 minutes a day with them. How long would it take you to figure out whether you wanted to fall in love with them or not? <laughs> Probably a long time. And so when you go immersive, if you spend a weekend away with someone, you know whether you like them or not. And meditation, mindfulness, all these habits are the same. The more you immerse yourself, the more you get an experience that stays with you, the more that you can live with that experience and keep going back to it for 10 minutes a day. So I really believe in immersive experiences. I love the 10 minute a day advice, but I also deeply believe in having a deep, immersive, absorbed experience that completely takes over your whole body, mind, and soul. We're wired for generosity, but we're educated for greed. I think I just Gosh, said it to you two years ago so when I was good, on the podcast. Yes. And it's like, and, and when I said that in the that's statement, so it was, a, yeah, and it's so true, we're wired for generosity, oh but gosh. we're educated for greed, because what happens is, when we're kids, you'll see kids you share. share, go out their you way, they want to share. It's yeah. part of my candy bar, whatever, totally. right? Yeah. yeah, and then as we get older, we're told that there's less, and this is what the key is. As we get older, we're told there are finite numbers of how many kids get made on the basketball or baseball team. Yes. We're told there's we're a limited. finite number of college spaces. We're told there's a finite number of how many tickets there are. We're told there's a finite number of people that are successful. Guess what? In the theater of happiness, there are infinite and unlimited seats. And there is a seat <laughs> with your name on it. That's okay. There is a seat with your name on it in the theater of dreams, in wow. the theater of happiness. But you think that because you think that there are only 100 people allowed in, that if someone else makes it before you, that you don't get in. And guess what? Is there a cap on how many billionaires there are in the world? No. No. Is there a cap on how many millionaires there are in the world? No. no. Is there a cap on how many happy people there are in the world? No. no. And that's why I really am encouraging Forbes. I want Forbes, forget printing a rich list, happiness print a happy list, list. Wow. print a service list, print wow. a list of who is serving. Yeah, we should do Who's that. Who's serving the most in the world? Wow. Right? That'll, be, that'll be competition Ta based. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> I gave more than you yeah, gave. And that's why it should be service based on time, energy, and money. Uh -huh. Because we should start showing how much time people give, mm -hmm. how much energy people give. Mm -hmm. Mother Teresa, I don't think she gave any money to her charities. Right. But she gave a lot of time and energy. Yeah. You know, you look at all the people who made a change in the world, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, like, they may not have given a lot of money to stuff. Yeah. They you, gave time and energy. You don't have to give resources, but your resourcefulness your love, your time, love your focus, your attention, your compassion. Love that. 
uh, you know, yeah. resourcefulness of the of the heart, not of the wallet. I think is Love key. That. And you don't need to have a lot of money to make a big impact. You don't. Yeah. There's and and this is the training. See, we've been educated for greed because we've been told everything's limited. There's limited number of this, limited number of this number. And every time you play in numbers, and I think it was Bob Marley who said it, but every time you play in numbers, you'll always be dissatisfied because uh, guess what? Someone's always got more. Someone's always gonna have more. I was speaking to a friend recently, and and it's, and and this friend was telling me that he. Uh, you know, bought a home, which is very expensive. Yes. Uh, very, very expensive. And he went to a party at someone else's house. And he told me that when he was getting a tour of this party, he found out that this person had a painting on his wall, which cost the amount his house cost. Shut up. <laughs> and so he was joking with wow. me. He was like, that, that guy's painting. painting in the he's, house. he's got my house on his wall. Wow. <laughs> and, and that just puts things into perspective. And you think about that, like, and then you look at someone like Jeff Bezos and you think, oh, well, he's the richest man in the world, but does he have the most fame? No, he doesn't. Right. Does he have the most beauty? Uh, subjective dis right. decision. Does he have the most strength or power? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. And so no one has the most of everything. So when you measure yourself by numbers, you'll always be second, third, fourth, fifth in something. I do feel that it's my responsibility to get my intentions right. And so one of my biggest visualizations that I do do in the morning is I, so I believe that good intentions in our life are seeds and bad intentions are weeds. And so what so I- Seeds and weeds seeds system. Seeds and weeds. Good, and every good. single day- See what why I, he's getting the followers. <laughs> he's gonna get the likes with the seeds and weeds. Every- That's, that's very Snoop. It's very Snoop. Yeah. Yeah? So okay. different, different yeah. seeds and yeah. different weeds. Different seeds. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. I, I like that, yeah. Thanks, mate, go on. Yeah. Uh, we'll, no, so I was saying, so what I do is I- reflect on my intentions visually every day. And I think about how many deals am I taking just because they make me money? Or how many videos am I making just because they get me views? Or how much stuff am I doing just for the vanity or just for the fame or success or what I think is, is going to be good for me, like financially, economic, like how the, how the default mind is set up to think about security as opposed to love and compassion and wanting to change the world and wanting to make a different place. And I'm constantly battling with the two. So what I would do every day is I'll reflect on my intentions. I'll reflect on the deals I've just signed. I'll reflect on uh, things I'm being offered. And I'll literally look at each offer, deal, whatever it is, each item of thought. And I'll say, is that a seed or a weed? And if it's a weed, I'll pluck it out. I'll literally visualize myself plucking it out of the, the garden of my mind and pulling it out and taking it out. And if it's a seed, then I'll water it. And I'll say, okay, I want that to grow because I am doing that for the right intention. When you can be trusted with the small things and the small moments, you get trusted with more and more and more. And so like, it helps to just, in that moment, and it's in those painful moments that you realize how powerful you are. We all know that, like you really yes. recognize it. And, and what you said was beautiful about not rushing through the pain because, and, and you know, I, I, this example has probably been shared before, but if you have a wound and you've cut yourself, it's like, you can't rush the healing. You can't rush it. If you broke your arm, I mean, and you've been through so many bodily yes. injuries, you can't rush the process. It's gonna take six weeks minimum to heal broken bone. Yeah, Correct. minimum. And you've got to sit through that. It's painful. You, there's no it injections you can take. There's no videos you can watch. There's nothing you can listen to. But our challenge is we try and rush through the pain. Yeah rather than reflect through the pain. We try to rush the healing process Try to too. rush the healing and you can't rush healing and healing is meant to be slow because it buys you time. It buys you reflection. It gives you so much space. To slow down. To slow down. And that's what your body's calling out for. And this is our emergency. Like how many times have you heard it where you slow down, you slow down and that's when you fall ill. Because guess what, your body has been trying to tell you to slow, slow down. down yeah. When you feel pain, so I, I write about it and think like a monk, Pain makes you pay attention. Yeah. That's what pain's for. Pain's not- Notice like, this. Notice this. Look notice at me. Notice me, look yeah. at me. It's, cra it's like a crying baby craving yeah. for attention. When a baby's crying, you don't just go, ah, oh, it's crying. <laughs> you don't just go, oh yeah, we'll just put it in another room and forget about it, right? <laughs> like you go to it and you find its needs. Whereas with our pain, when something's painful, we're just like, oh yeah, I'll just forget about it. I'll escape from it, I'll do something else. Yeah. You have to go into I'll that pain. It. I'll numb the pain. I'll numb the pain, with that's the alcohol it. or whatever. Yeah. But, 100%, that's, that's usually our response is, what can I do to numb this? Work more, have sex more, drink more, whatever. drugs more, whatever it is. Rather than let me actually become alert, and guess what, the pain just gets higher and mm -hmm. higher and higher and higher because unfortunately, until it really hurts, we don't stop. And, or you need more and more to numb it with. So true. How many of you spend a lot of your days multitasking? Okay, good. 
So a lot of us spend our time multitasking. Now studies show that only 2% of us are actually able to multitask. And when most people hear that, they're like, yeah, I'm in that 2%. <laughs> That's me, right? I'm in that 2%. Uh, you're probably not, I'm not, because it's only 2% of the global population of the world. Multitasking is a myth. And I find that as spiritual activists, as conscious change makers, as change agents of the world, whatever you want to call yourself, all of us, one of the biggest mistakes we've seen, and this was the quote that I shared and a thought from Martin Luther King that I've really held close to me, is he said, those who love peace need to learn to organize themselves as well as those who love war, mm -hmm. right? Those who love peace need to learn to organize themselves as well as those who love war, i.e., people who are trying to build destruction in the world and distractions in the world are highly organized, highly focused, highly data-oriented, highly strategic, highly process-driven. And so we have to be the same. And when you spend time with Vision, or you spend time with the Mind Valley team, you realize their success is intuitive, it is deep, it is full of love, but it is also highly strategic, it is also highly focused, and therefore it's effective. And so for me, my plea to all of you and to myself is whatever we're gonna do, let's get really strategic about it. Let's bring sincerity and strategy together. Let's bring data and dynamism together. Let's bring intuition and insight together. Right? Let's not, let's not look beyond that and think, oh, that stuff's going to work out because I inten my intention's nice. Right? Your intention's not going to run a mile, but it will help you run the marathon. But it's not going to run that mile that you need to do right now. And so for me, intention and action, intention and attention, both of them are required. And so my recommendation is whatever your dream is, whatever you're inspired by, whatever you think is going to have a positive impact on the world, bring both to that, right? Don't settle for one or the other. In 2016, I moved out to New York. So just let me paint a picture of 2016. I moved three jobs. I got married. Wow. I moved country. And I... Just, just started a whole new life. Like my life just transformed. So we went through all of that with my wife yes. in one year. And by the way, all of that was surprises. The job change was surprises. Yeah. The country change was a surprise. The marriage was not a surprise. We planned right, that. Right, right, right. But apart from everything else, everything was a surprise. Now I said I like surprises, so I can <laughs> roll with it. But my point is that's a lot of transition in a so year. So much transition. And I felt the burden of being in a new city where we had no family, we had no friends. And my wife, who loves being around her family and no one understands just how close she is to them, I felt this burden on me that I had taken away her time with her mm. family and now she was alone. So I was going out to work and she'd be crying at home. Mm. And I was thinking, she's got no friends, she's got no support. And I know you can relate to this yes. with moving and it's relationships lot, and so much going on. And so it's like, I'm dealing with that. And guess what, six months later, I have to leave and move on and work on a new career to build everything myself and then I'm four months away from being broke. And so on top of all of this, I've now got four months away from being broke. I've got enough money, money to save for four months to pay for rent and groceries and in that's it. In New York it. City. In New yeah. York City and that's <laughs> it. And guess what, even on top of that, I've got 30 days before my visa runs out and I'm kicked out of the country. So I can't even live here anymore. So not only have I just got married, moved job three times, changed career again, had to move into a apartment, four months of being broke, and I might get kicked out in 30 days, and my renewal for my visa cost $15,000. Oh. So that's gonna eat into those four months. I have probably never been under that much emotional, yeah. physical, and, and mental pressure in my life. Like genuinely, I felt it. And I felt my body change. My, my breath was more stressed. I would be breathing faster, shorter, shorter breaths, not deep breaths, heart beating not faster, out. not working out. You get into lazy habits, you start craving junk food. Sugar to get energy. I'm out. living in a 500 square foot apartment with my wife, which is, which is tiny, like everything's in that space. And guess what, we both work from home. So I'm now sitting at a desk, hunched over, trying to figure stuff out. Out. she's trying to cook in the same room like I'm trying to just just trying to figure out what to do and I remember the next morning sending like a hundred emails to people and just being like this is who I am this is what I can do how can we serve and that was the same year that I ended up meeting you later yeah. in that year mm -hmm. and the beginning three months of that journey was so stressful like they were so stressful because I was like what if I have to move back to London 
what am I going to say to her parents? I mean, I just took their daughter away. Like, uh, <laughs> I just got married. I've yeah. lived in New York City for six months, and my life's falling apart. Like, you know, so much, and I've got all these views, but there's nothing. There's nothing mm. happening. And we met. You also, you also. I mean, at this time, you're also growing so much. How are you able to create and reach this impact with your videos as yeah. that's growing? while you're under so much stress and uncertainty. And I stopped a bit at that time, like things slowed down hard, like things slowed down. I remember that. I, I wasn't creating as much as I was because I don't enjoy creating from stress or pressure, and I don't think you can really create something from stress and pressure, so we really slowed down at that time. And when I was creating, I was creating from a place of recognizing that I could share what I had learned and what I had grown in so far. So anything I was sharing was like, this is what I've learned so far. So that was the biggest pain that I've been through in the last seven years, wow. for sure. And all I can say is that I remember coming home to my wife knowing that this was gonna be the truth. And I came home and I said to her, I said to her, I guarantee you, this is gonna be the best thing that ever happened to us. What, the pain? The pain. I said that to her the night I came home, wow. and then she gave up to that. I literally came home, I looked her in the eyes and go, this is the scenario. And I just want you to know that I guarantee to you this is the best thing that's ever gonna happen to us. And I said to her, and this is, this is a monk statement that we used to repeat, I said to her, I'm just not gonna judge the moment. Don't judge the moment, because what we do is we try to label moments as good or bad. And when you label a moment as bad, it now does not have the opportunity to become good. I'll give an example, if I go, I don't like this book, this book's bad, right? And I don't, and I love this book. But if I say that, sure. guess what? I will never pick it up and recognize the value that's inside of it because you've labeled it. Yes. And we label stuff, like we label, oh, that restaurant's bad. Mm. But when you label a that moment, person's bad, that now. person's bad, now you can't learn from that person. Oh, a great one, that's a really good one. Mm. As soon as you start labeling people or anything as good or bad, you limit it. You stop it from being something else. And here's the truth, every moment can evolve into being anything if you give it the opportunity to. Right. But as soon as you say it's got no value anymore, you lose it. And so for me, I had to say to myself, don't judge the moment. And I'd keep repeating that don't to myself. Don't judge where you're at. Don't judge What's this. What's happening. Yeah, don't judge it as negative. Don't, mm -hmm. don't just start saying it's negative. Because guess what, we've all been in positions where a gift turned into a curse and a curse turned into a That's gift. That's true. Right? We've also Where our dreams came true and it ended up not being what we wanted. Exactly. And it fell apart and it led us into the, our dreams. Totally. Why is it that so many people that win the lottery yeah. go broke? Yeah. Gifts can turn into curses too. True. But because we label them as the best moment in our life or the worst moment in our life. Whereas when you approach things to neutrality and just what you have on the table, you can be like, okay, what am I going to do next? How have you related to deep spiritual learnings and at the same time being happy and content in the material world without going crazy? <laughs> Interesting question. I think that's the point of spiritual training. So it's like when we're, when we're immature in our spiritual learning, we're just starting out. When you first learn the first, everyone remember the first time they learned something? And they were like, I'm never talking to my family ever again, right? It's like, because you, you learn a little bit and you go, oh my God, I've been doing it all wrong. And now I can't talk to that person, I can't ever go to that event again. And you start making all these big decisions based on something small that you've learned. And so I think in the beginning of our lives, because to protect ourselves, which is a very normal desire and very good and very human, we think, okay, I need to take care of this, so now I'm gonna shut out from all of this. But as we grow, we realize we can give more back. And so one of the ways I've always thought about it is, if you look at the ocean and you see someone drowning, you wanna help them. But if you go in too soon and you're not strong enough, it's likely that you're gonna get pulled in. And at that point, it's easier to shout out to a lifeguard who can come along, who's trained, who's disciplined, who's committed, who can go and make a difference. And so for me in my life, I'm always looking at if I can't bring someone up, I'm not gonna spend time with them if they're gonna pull me down. And it's drawing that line for me. So if I've been ever scared about my spirituality, rather than putting them down and going, oh, I'm not spending time with them because I'm putting them down, if I can't lift them up, then I'm gonna protect myself by not being dragged down. But if I can pull them up, if I can lift them up, then that's when I'm able to go into that space and make an impact and make a difference. And that line has really helped me not go crazy because now I'm not doing it based on a judgment of them, I'm reflecting on my own abilities and flaws and, and the difference I can make. And I'm taking a, taking a stance. It's like someone asked me the other day, what is a complaint? 
And when we're talking about litter, a complaint is you see a piece of trash on the floor and you go, oh, LA is so dirty. You've removed the agency that you can have an impact on that. A statement is, oh, LA is a bit dirty, there's trash on the floor, I'm gonna pick that up and throw it away. Right, taking that responsibility. So when we're irresponsible in our spiritual lives, we judge everyone and judge everything. And we mature, we start looking at through compassion, empathy, and connection, and recognize we were just there a few years ago. And that's the biggest anchor in my life, is recognizing that I was addicted to, and still am in different ways, things that I don't believe are good for me spiritually, and I was that, I was that guy, I was that kid, you know? And it's taken a journey, and someone had to believe in me. Someone had to invest in me. Someone had to reach their hand without being forced in and pull me out. And so that allows me to continue to operate in the world. I hope that answers your question. If you want 10 more amazing rules from Jay Shetty, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. Jay, I'm really curious. How does this work? It's, it's what's known as a sincere request. Or, mm. or, a, or, a, or a deep intention, right? And so a question meditation is, I want you to sit with the question that causes you 